Okay, um, continuing in chapter 9, we're going to look at something called moment of inertia and figure out what that means and how to calculate that, um, which leads to some calculus fun. And then we're going to connect that to the idea of rotational kinetic energy, which has a pretty simple formula, um, and that one um, the analogy works really well with. Turns out moment of inertia is our analogy for mass. So when we have a linear problem, we say we have mass in it. And for a rotational problem, instead of mass, we use something called the moment of inertia, which is related to mass, but more importantly related to how that mass is distributed through the object. <clears throat> so um, it turns out that um, the more you spread your mass outward, the the more difficult it is to rotate you and the more difficult it is to change your rotation, to slow you down or speed you up um, in terms of angular velocity. And as you come towards the center, it's easier to go faster. It really has to do with the, um, a change in angular momentum as well, which is also based on this moment of inertia guy. So this moment of inertia is a sum. It's the sum of all the particles that make up a system. Now that might be atoms, though it's very difficult to add up Avogadro's number worth of atoms. It might also be, you can you can simplify in the macroscopic world here, in this picture we've got a several disks, and we're going to behave as if those disks were point particles. They, this disk is at this point, this disk is at this point, and this disk is at this point. Now what do you rotate it about? That matters. So they look they put the um, axis of rotation through B, the centers of B and C, and then they spin it around. So the moment of inertia, you take the mass of each particle times its radius, well, the radius is a bad term, um, times its distance from the center of rotation, the axis of rotation. So that r is not a radius, it's a distance to the axis of rotation, which as it spins around in its plane, that is a radius, right? As it goes around that axis, it becomes a radius because it's going to have circular motion. Um, every particle, no matter what the weird shape of the object is, every little piece of it has a circular motion shape if you look at, like if you were to draw a line or if it left a trail of its path. Um, and so in a way it's a radius. The rotational kinetic energy is just one half i omega squared. Instead of one half mv squared, the m becomes a moment of inertia, i. i is the letter we use for moment of inertia. And um, v is omega again. Right, so this symbol here. Let's look on the next page. Actually, um, this symbol here, that sum of, becomes really important. So what it is, let's say you have this guy has a moment of inertia and this guy has a moment of inertia about the same axis. If you glue them together so that they still share that rotational axis, you just add the moments of inertia together. That's what that sigma tells you to sum them, and you can do that for as many particles as you want, as long as you get the the m and the r, the m and the i right you can add those moment of inertias together. Uh, there's the kinetic energy one, just to keep handy, have that written somewhere big, though because you know 1 half mv squared so well already, this should be very easy, it comes right to you in that analogy. So here's a problem for you to solve, you've got a mass, it's got a location, um, and you want to put another mass so that um, if you were to spin the whole system around the z-axis, be careful there, you know, that your moment of inertia would be zero. So you want to set up the formula with an x and a y as a variable, as the x-y coordinates of the thing, and um, try to, you know, and do the sum of m i r i squared for two particles, so it'll be a two-part sum. Here is another one. This is, is this one is far more difficult um, and interesting. Um, so you have uh, a, a piece of wire of length three b. So each side is of length b, and the total thing has a mass of m. So each side has a mass one third m. But that's not the issue. The problem with um, moment of inertia is it's usually not. You can't usually treat it as if it's at its center of mass center of mass of the object and the um, the moment of inertia are only vaguely tied to each other. This mo the center of mass one was the sum of m's r's, m times r over m, not r squared, and the r squared changes things dramatically. So see if you can puzzle this out, but don't feel bad if you can't. We may need to do this one together. 
So there's a lot of calculus involved in some of these, and they can be fun calculus problems, or they can be horrific calculus problems. They can even be problems that only a computer can solve if the shape is strange or rough, right? So they give you some, out of kindness. You notice that each of them has a units of mr squared. There's usually some fraction out in front. In this, in the case of this guy, you've got uh, a and b to worry about, right? Um, so the easiest way to think of these is you're allowed to slice them into any kind of slices that you want, as long as you add up all of those slices, either in a calculus way or in an algebra way, to get all of the pieces there. For instance, if you look at this hollow cylinder here, every piece, every little m, is a distance r away from the center. So each little dm is at a distance r. So you take the sum of um, dm times r, and you just get m r squared. The total mass. So the other guys are calculus problems that are significantly more difficult um, and possibly interesting. Um, and there are usually tricks and ways to find the answers so that you don't have to do too crazy a calculus problem. Um, often you have to use a coordinate system that's a little different than you're expecting. And until you get some experience using um, polar coordinates for calculus, they can be tough. So this was interesting. The, the first high jumper who figured this out changed the sport dramatically. Um, this high jumper's center of mass is below the actual bar, right? So she's able to give herself a gravitational potential energy that's actually lower than the bar and still get over it. Um, funky stuff. So... Um, so regardless of the shape of the body, if it is weird and spinning and whatnot, that doesn't matter. It's gravitational potential energy. Just treat it as if it has the gravitational uh, potential energy at the center of mass. You don't really have to worry about rotational gravitational potential energy. There's no need uh, for a new formula there. Uh, the parallel axis theorem is super important. Um, a little bit tough to fathom what it's about, but once you do, the math itself is super easy. Okay, so let's take a look at it. You've got this strange object, this moment of inertia for some axis for this this object for the axis that is parallel to it, right? So here's um, the axis that's parallel. This is where the hinge is, right? It's parallel to the axis that goes through the center of mass. So you find the axis through the center of mass as if you were going to spin it here. But this is the actual axis you want to spin it over. So let's say this one, you look up on that table and you know that the center of um, mass is here. But you're actually going to spin it about the edge. That happens a lot about the edge. So if you do that with a sphere, normally you spin a sphere about an axis that goes through its center. But you technically could sort of latch something onto the edge of it and spin the sphere like this, right? To find its new moment of inertia, you take the moment of inertia through the center of mass and add to it m d squared, where d is the distance between the axis that goes through the center of mass and the parallel axis that goes through what you're actually going to spin it about, the new moment of inertia axis of rotation. Once you get that through your head, it becomes um, doable very easily, but tough to imagine. You're imagining things in 3D spinning. Um, not everybody's great at that without some practice. All right, so here's a solid sphere. This one I was an example I was just using. It's got a moment of inertia i um, about an axis that is tangent to its surface. So be careful. This is backwards, right? I'm giving you the parallel axis, and you're going to find um, the axis through the center, right? Through its center of mass. So you're going to do this backwards. Tricky. Okay, so here we've got an axis through the center of this cylinder. There's a little bit of calculus you can do here. You know the moment of inertia of um, a super thin slice of this, a little dr slice. Um, we looked at that. Everybody here is a distance r away from the center and has a little mass dm. And so the mass of this slice you're allowed to add up. And... Um, you've got an inner R and an outer R, and you add up all the little DRs. So you're going to take an integral, but you're only going to do it in one dimension. You're going to add the DRs from R equals R1 to R equals R2. The super hard thing about this one is figuring out what's the mass of each of the cylinders that's in the center. And you have to sort of create yourself a constant using 
excuse me, the, the density or, um, at least a linear density of that guy. And I will probably show you how to do this in class. If you remind me, this is uh, one we need to do together, I think, on the board. Yeah, this is kind of a neat trick. The solid sphere one is actually difficult to do, but the um, a disc is really easy to do. So let's do the calculus for the disc in class together and then see if we can extrapolate the... Um, the spheres answer from that, uh, adding up all the little drs from this end of the sphere to this end of the sphere, because each each moment of inertia adds up. So the moment of inertia is of this disc plus all of the discs that would make up the sphere, all of changing radiuses, right? Um, give you the total moment of inertia. So adding that sigma is really an integral symbol. It's just adding an, an integral is just adding an infinite uh, a number of infinitesimal little guys as opposed to the sigma, which is adding um, a finite number of finite guys, usually.